The Lord be with you. you. See some of y'all fanning. I'm hot too if it helps you at all. It's it's that weird time of year. You know, it's January and 70. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the third chapter of Matthew's Gospel. (coughs) Matthew chapter 3, we'll be reading verses 13 through 17 there. Matthew chapter 3, beginning from verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O oh God, help us to have ears to hear, eyes that see, hearts open to receive, hands and feet at the ready for whatever it is you're calling us to today. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. It's just a piece of paper. That's all. There's nothing terribly special about it, nothing magical in its composition, nothing of imminent importance written on it. It's, it's just a piece of paper. It's hanging on the wall in my office, right next to a very similar piece of paper. Both are framed in wood and glass. There are four signatures on it, a seal between them, and across the top in script letters, two words, Samford University. I remember when I got that piece of paper, almost, this is weird for me to say, 14 years ago, I was standing in the cinder block corridors in the bowels of the BJCC in Birmingham, in line with a couple hundred other people in black robes and black hats with little yellow tassels on them. We were waiting for the whole commencement ceremony to start, to walk out onto the arena floor. They had divided it with a big curtain, the big seal for Sanford was there. We had to find our way to the correct aisle, the correct row of metal folding chairs, and then take our seat in the proper one. And I remember being nervous, and how odd it was to be nervous, talking to myself, telling myself, Chris, they're going to let you graduate. All the tests are over. All the papers have been turned in. No more books to read. No more schedules to make. No more lectures to attend. You have all your convo credits, all that sort of stuff. In a couple of hours, I'd be leaving that arena with that piece of paper. But in the grand scheme of things, if I had decided at that moment to just step out of line, walk out of the building, wait in the parking lot for Sally and my family so we could go down to Jim and Nick's, because after all, that's the only reason I was there, it wouldn't have changed a thing. They would have just mailed me that piece of paper. Still, I I was nervous. But why? I mean, it's... It's just a piece of paper. It doesn't even have sharp edges. I watched as row after row in front of me stood, walked down the aisle, single file, to the steps that led up to the stage. And one by one, as the dean of their respective schools called out their full legal name, they walked across the stage, shook Tom Quartz's hand as he handed them a piece of paper and a blue leather folio. They walked across the stage where they shook the provost, Brad Creed's hand, as he showed them down the stairs. I watched this happen until I realized that, well, the row in front of me was gone. And now here we were, walking down the aisle. It wasn't like I had to give a speech. It wasn't like I was going to sing. It wasn't like I was going to stand in front of those hundreds of people in that arena while they gawked at me. All I had to do was walk and not forget how to shake hands. The hardest part, really, was to shake with the right hand and take the diploma with the left. I mean, I even practiced it. 
I don't recall how long it took, but all of a sudden I was standing there at the top of the steps and Dean Chapman said, Christopher Paul Thomas. I walked across the stage, shook the hand of a man I deeply admired and respected, the late Dr. Tom Quartz, as he handed me that piece of paper. And I carried on down the other steps, pausing only for a moment in front of a blue sheet, flipping open the little folio to show a camera that piece of paper. I have no idea where that picture is. It may be in, in the FBI vault somewhere. I don't know. But as I walked back to my seat, that piece of paper felt simultaneously as if it had the mass of a feather and all of the cosmos. It felt like a weight that had been lifted off my shoulders, while at the same time a promise of what was to come, the burden of potential, the fulfillment of generations who had worked so hard. But it's just a piece of paper. No one has ever asked to see it. Did you know that? Nobody really even stops to glance at it. It's just there on my wall. It's just a piece of paper. It's just bread. That's all. A little bit of flour, water, maybe an egg. I don't know. I'm not a baker. But I'm sure it's not much. Sometimes it's bought at the store, off the shelf, in a bag, maybe in a box. Sometimes it's just crackers. Sometimes it's baked in someone's kitchen using a recipe, handwritten on a note card, handed down from generation to generation, carefully brought together and baked at the right temperature. But still, it's just bread. It's just bread. There's nothing special about it. It's not made from some rare heirloom species of grain that can, only be, that can only grow in the light of a blue moon. It's not baked by the elusive heat of dragon's breath or in handmade earthen vessels several millennia old. It's just bread. Most times, it's the same stuff with which you might sop up a, a runny egg at home or spread a little peanut butter on and fold it over and eat just before bed. It's just bread. Just juice. To be honest, sometimes I wish it was wine, but it's just juice. Not even hand squeezed juice. Hardly named brand. I think the jug's but no jug's not back here. It's on, oh, it's on the. It's it's empty. <clears throat> sometimes it is wine, but it's not like the stuff you'd buy to try to impress company with words you can't pronounce or stuff imported from places with French and Italian sounding names. It's usually the cheaper stuff, often mixed with a little bit of water. It's not like it's bottled by some private holy order of monks in a hidden monastery in wine country. It's just wine. Not even that, it's just juice. It's just bread, it's just juice. So why do my hands still shake a bit whenever I pick up that plate or hold that small bit of bread between my fingers. Why am I always so nervous that I'm going to spill that little, little cup of juice? I mean, it's just bread. It's just juice. It's just water. Two simple hydrogen atoms bonded together with one oxygen atom at a temperature low enough to keep it from turning to vapor yet high enough to make the preacher sweat. It doesn't come from special sources. It's not blessed by some pope. It doesn't come from some spring that runs through blessed pipes. It's just water. Sometimes it can be the same water children play in, fish swim in, crawdads crawl in. Sometimes it's in a big fiberglass tub. Other times it's in steel bowls or cement pools. I've even seen it in plastic troughs right before a cow or a horse will come to take a drink. There's nothing special, nothing magical. It's just water. There's no angel troubling its surface. There are no blessed essential oils added. No intentional chemicals added to change its composition. It's the same water someone might dip their hands in for a cool drink on a warm afternoon. It's just water. It's just water. Yet John, John felt called to stand out in the middle of it all 
in the middle of that water to call the masses to repentance, to align themselves with some new thing God was up to in the world. John used that water as a way to call folks into the dominion of God that was breaking into their reality. Not in some grandiose show of might and power, not by the pomp and circumstance associated with the coronation of royalty or the military marches of world superpowers, but through simple things, you know, like water, like bread, like wine, like generosity and love. It's just water, but John stood in it, dipped people into it to say that something new was beginning. Something was coming. Something transformative. Someone. Someone who was going to show them the way. It's just water, but Matthew says that Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him in the water of the Jordan. Jesus did it with some intention. Got up in the morning and went to see his cousin. Jesus is not just one in the crowd moved by the rhetorical thunder of John's message. He got up that morning, walked from Galilee to his cousin baptizing in the Jordan with the intention of being baptized by him. Jesus joined the crowd intending to go down in the water to inaugurate the inbreaking of God's kingdom in a public, simple way. No flash photography, no video cameras. Just him, a crowd of people, and John. A way that points to the unexpectedness of God's power. A way that points to the method of a God who, who moves in such a way that faith necessitates its reality. After all, if it's just water, what's really so special about it? I mean, it's a river. Somewhere up or downstream, someone was feeding their sheep drinking from the river. Why bother with it all if it's just water? I think it bears closer examination that John doesn't want to baptize Jesus. I think, I think we can relate to John, maybe. I think it reflects the early church's discomfort with the notion that Jesus would be baptized. John, after all, was preaching a baptism for what? Repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And so those early Christians were uncomfortable. Jesus came to be baptized? To this day, many Christians are a bit squirmy about this whole idea that Jesus would be baptized. John's hesitancy in Matthew, I think, uh, gives voice to our concern. John says, uh, uh, I need to be baptized by you. Do you come to me? I can imagine John saying, hold up, cuz, it's just water. It's just a symbol for these folks. These folks. You don't need to be baptized. You don't need to bother with this Jesus. If anything, I'll tell you what, let, let's tag in. You baptize me and you start baptizing them on down the road. But thankfully, Matthew gives us an out from Jesus. No, 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 John. Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Let's go on ahead and do this, John. You know, to fulfill all righteousness. What in the world does that mean? I'm asking you, what does that mean? I don't know. Is Jesus simply being, being alive not enough to fulfill all righteousness? Is what Jesus is going to do later on not enough to fulfill all righteousness? This is just water. He'll towel off and dry in the hot sun of ancient Judea. But this is the way to fulfill all righteousness. No one was there to catch the water as it dripped off of Jesus. No one was there to fold the towel up nice and neat, put it in a, in a big Ziploc bag, keep this, we're going to put it in a museum one day. No. You know, all four Gospels, all four of them, begin Jesus' ministry here by the water. John's Gospel is so nervous about Jesus' baptism that he doesn't actually say Jesus was baptized. And yeah, we get angels, shepherds, and magis, and in the beginning was the Word from the other Gospels. But the real action, the real beginning of Jesus' ministry begins here at the Jordan with John 
in the water. John the Baptist functions as a continuation of the tradition of Elijah, the prophets of old, those who called out the way of the Lord, those whose hearts had grown too hard, whose eyes were too clouded by the lure of power, wealth, and comfort. John stood as the culmination of all that was to come before, all that had happened before, and Jesus was all that was breaking through. The breaching of heaven with earth, and earth with heaven, and the water. The water was the fulcrum, the hinge upon which this new thing was swinging. It's just water. But in that water was the beginning of what all that came before had been calling all us towards. It's just water, but in the water is the culmination of prayer, expectation, and hope for what comes after, what's breaking in. Just like that piece of paper is more than just a receipt for tuition and the work that one puts towards his or her degree, it's a promise of what's to come, the hope of possibility, the marking of one's potential in his or her field. It's, it's just bread and juice, but when the people of God gather around the table to eat and drink it, it becomes more. Together it becomes more, more than just a symbol of remembrance, but a promise of what the kingdom of God looks like. It's the coming together of people around one table and one room, but also around the world and through the centuries, claiming a shared hope in God's presence in Christ. It's just water. It's just bread. It's just juice. But in the presence of God's gathered people, they become so much more. They become the markers of an unexpected community. Gifts of an unexpected community. As we join countless others at the table, in the bread, in the cup, through the water. Baptism and communion are those gifts that remind us who we are. And I want you to hear that again. They are gifts that remind us who we are. All of us. Not just the ones who do it the same way we do. Not just the ones who believe the same way we do. All of us. These are gifts hidden, not <clears throat> these are gifts hidden or concealed like, not hidden or concealed like secret handshakes or hidden passwords. They're bread and juice, water, things not hidden or exclusively for us. You buy them at the store. Have it piped in your house. Christ's baptism shows us that, that if God, God's self, passed through the waters of baptism, calling us through the same waters, then we cannot act as gatekeepers, keeping some back from the water while granting access to others. If Christ broke bread and shared a cup with his disciples, including, mind you, Judas, before they fully comprehended what was going to happen, if Jesus entrusted us with these gifts to bring us together and call us into the deeper love of God, then we cannot act like holy brokers of such gifts, refusing to make room for all who seek a place at the table. Water, bread, juice, simple things, common things, cheap things, but holy gifts given to us so that we may remember the one who gave them. Gifts given to call us in the work of God's still in breaking kingdom. Gifts given that call us into an unexpected community of those like us, those unlike us, and those who don't like us, and those that we don't like. The kingdom of God is an unexpected community united in Christ, brought together by the simplest of things. Water. Bread, cup. These gifts aren't for those who are worthy. If they were, we'd leave them sitting right there on the table and all go home. These gifts aren't for just those of us who have it figured out. If that was the case, that tub would get filled a whole lot less. These gifts aren't just for those who know the right answers who've prayed the right prayers, who've lived the right way, who gets to decide what those things are anyway. These gifts are for all of us 
who seek to know God and to know God more. These gifts are for all of us who have faith and for all of us who have doubt. These gifts are for all of those of us who wonder and all of us who wander just a bit. These gifts are for all of us. They're for you. They're for me. For all of us. So as we come to the Lord's table this morning, these gifts, simple as they are, are for you. Christ calls us all to the water. Christ calls us all to the table. All of us. And when we come to the water, when we come to the table, we join the countless others around the world and through the centuries, coming together as one unexpected community in Christ our Lord. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit. Lord, as we come now to your table, we ask you to bless it, the bread, juice, simple as they are. But we ask that you use them to remind us of who we are, of who you are, and who you call us to be. Be with us now, Lord, as we come to this time, as we come to your table. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.